okay right we all on so we are here i had to remember to hit the record button before we went too far into our conversation here with my amazing br- co-host bryce watson esoteric atlanta who you all know and first time on my channel second time on your channel bryce the lovely lovely jamie soleil from canada so jamie how are you doing oh i'm hanging in i'm doing okay you know just constantly uh, focused on finding the good in, in every day. I'm just, it's like, I want to get out of my skin some days, but you know, we're just trying to stay positive. How are you, how are you ladies doing? Really good in <laughs> general, but we were just having, we've had so many conversations today, haven't we, Bryce? A lot of lessons being learned at the moment, shall I say. <laughs> on a personal level for me, a lot of lessons to be learning, but I've reached that stage where I can laugh about them. <laughs> It's it's good. Laughing is important. It's really important. But before we get into the nitty gritty of today, can you introduce yourself, Jamie, which I know you don't like doing, so we'll add a few bits in there. Um, Just for those people. Yeah, we're going to insist. We're going to make you cringe. So tell us about your amazing Olympic career. And Okay. Well, so my background is I was a, a pairs ice skater. And I've been to two Olympics. I was in 1994 with my first partner in Lillehammer, Norway. And then I um, paired up with uh, my 2002 Olympic partner, David Peltier. And we were in Salt Lake City. Um, We were part of, we're going to talk about this, but a part of um, a judging scandal. And then um, I don't know what else to say about me. I guess I I became, uh, after my, we toured for 10 years with Stars on Ice and did other ice shows. Wow. across uh, North America and, and even Asia. And then um, I've had two children. I have a, a son that's 14 and a daughter that's eight and um, going through a lot, my second divorce now. And um, yeah, just trying to regroup through all of this because I woke up last January to what was going on in this world, even though I was fairly aware of specific things that we can get into as well. But um that really rocked my world um like many of your listeners are probably nodding going yeah me too um just my awakening went happened really quickly and i i threw everybody like off big time and uh to the point where they didn't some of them didn't even want to be around me anymore because i was part of a white supremacist community or i was a racist well same thing and or i was a a risk to be around that was the other one because i'm not Hi, I'm one of those too. <laughs> same, same. Yeah. It's a nice club to be part. It's a hard though. I mean, we're laughing about it, but I think most people listening will resonate with this a lot. Um, but you've, you've got such an amazing career with what you've done professionally. And we will be putting a lot of links about you and about some of the, we're, we're going to come on to talk about, about some of the documentaries you've been in and everything, because there, there's a lot of, publicity around your career as a professional sportswoman but before we get into that can I just ask you I know my daughter is an amazing soccer player and just sort of break into the professional scene I know firsthand what it takes um, mentally physically to reach the level that you reach which was the top of the top of your game there Mm -hmm. must be so many skills Jamie that you picked up with that that are now standing you in good stead Oh, sport teaches us a lot about life. Um, I mean, it, it, this is where it gets challenging for me now because um, as much as I love my sport and I loved competing, I loved um, the thrill of after I was done, you know, I, was, I used to get really, really nervous com- about to compete. But um, I've learned so much awakening through like the matrix and how this all works. And um, so I get, I, I stumble a little bit right now talking about how it I thought it should be or what had to be or whatever, how I was training. Like when you even messaged us the other day, like, um, what did you say? You said, uh, no pain, no gain. And I know that that's actually not a great way to be. Right. But we used to say that. And it was like, what can we do in our sport? Like, in our, um, what can David and I do to be that much better than everybody else? And so we, we always worked like we thought we worked harder and not necessarily longer, it wasn't about like how long you trained. It was like, we didn't want to leave anything on the table. So we had a trainer, we had a psychologist, like we had a whole team around us that was just trying to make us these lean, mean fighting machines. And um, it was incredible. But I think what I learned 
mostly was the power of visualization. I, which I used as a little girl, I used to see myself competing at the Olympics. And then when I got to that level, I realized how much more important it even was that you need to see yourself, you know, skating a perfect performance or playing a perfect game or not perfect, but like playing a, a good game, scoring or whatever. And then seeing the medal come around your neck, seeing your flag come down in the middle on the top of the podium. I saw it all. And now after, you know, I'm retired and I became a, a life coach, I also started visualizing other things. And like, I learned about manifesting, but I was like, I was doing this my whole life without even really knowing what I was doing. So that was the biggest thing I think I got from, um, from skating was, you know, learning the power of visualization and also um, the discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that don't want to do things when they're tired, sore, not feeling quite right. They'll just make excuses where when you're a top athlete, there you don't, you don't get those days, you show up and it doesn't really matter, you know, that there would be days where we go to the rink and we just didn't, we couldn't move. We were so stiff from our workout the day before, but it was like, what can you do today with how you feel? Whereas, you know, a lot of people in general just would go, I'm too sore. I'm not going to go today. Right. That would be a lot of, that was our, our head went there too. But when you're a top athlete, you, you, you have a different conversation in your head. You don't allow yourself to do that. Is it healthy? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, it got us there. And again, this is my struggle, right? With what we're, what we're made to do, what we're capable of doing. Cause we're always like push, 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 you know, more, more, more and harder, harder, harder. But I don't know if that's really the way that we're going to, this new earth that we're moving into. I don't know if that will be our way. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. I've got this ray of sun backwards and forwards between flowing. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's God's it's energy is within me. Exactly. So yeah, I'll just try and stay in the center and, it's amazing, isn't it, Bryce? Yeah, carry on. Because well, I was going to ask, and I, you can get divulged as to how deep you want to. Um, we always laugh that in the Ashtanga world, no one wants to hang out with us. We always do is we talk about periods and like uh, body functions. But I know, like, we were talking on the phone about some stuff and like the female body. I know the narrative is now that gender isn't a thing, but we know it is that the female body and the male body are two different bodies and have two different um, purposes, really. And I, I was telling you that even with the most advanced of Ashtanga, there are some postures that they do not allow women to do because of um, the way it can affect our uterus, especially mm -hmm. if you haven't had children yet. And we mm -hmm. actually have what we call ladies holiday, where the first three days of your cycle, you don't practice in order to let your body as a female athlete, I know that I used to practice throughout my period and I lost my period at one point. And so I had to then start honoring that because I realized that my body was getting maybe not enough body fat, like what was happening as a female athlete, how, how did you, how did, did, that, did that experience of being a woman, did you feel for females out there, like, did you feel when, when it was your time of the month, did you feel that, that discombobulation? Like, how did that affect you, your female hormones? I'm kind of a maybe abnormal athlete that way. I, I started getting my periods when I was 15 and I, I went on the pill probably around 17, somewhere around there. So I was, I had a regular period, but I actually competed really well when I got my periods. Like, oh, wow. yeah. I know it was wild. And I, I remember people saying, how come you don't PMS and how come you're not moody? And I said, no, oh, I'm just, I don't know. I never experienced that. Mm -hmm. I never got, you know, grouchy, if you will. And um, so when we go to a competition and I had it, obviously it wasn't comfortable in the sense that like, I, I got to make sure that, you know, nothing shows with yeah. my skating glasses, but I, I don't know why I always felt lighter. And a lot of my friends, we would talk and they felt heavier. And I go, I don't know what it was with my cycle, but I actually felt lighter. It was like a purging maybe. So yeah. I had a problem with that. And I never lost my period having, I think the lowest body fat though I had was 10% in 2002. Um, and that's low, but I never did lose a period at all. I, I was on a regular cycle. That's interesting. Yeah, because that's something that's a big conversation in the Ashtanga world. But it's interesting because we hear about all these other like athletes, like uh, runners, not having yeah. their periods for the duration of yeah. their But then you're like, but now we know what we know about what they do. And you're like, did they ever have a period now? Like, now you're kind of like, 
I was both <laughs> like this. Well, I think you need to be really careful getting into that because we were talking about earlier about the junk conspiracy and things yep. like that. And, you know, that's a lot because you uh, high level performance does affect people's cycles anyway. As you say, yeah. body fat does, emotional issues do and everything. So there's so many things that can affect mm. that. Being on the pill massively affects your whole hormonal balance and everything. So, you know, yeah. there's so many things that, that do affect it. I know in, in soccer, they've shown that you're much more likely to do your ACL when you're on your cycle and that's been proven and that's happened time and time again and i was just saying you know so many soccer players including my daughter have ruptured their acl I but even though that research was out there they didn't didn't share it but i think going back to what you were saying about how healthy is it to push through it sounds like it was a dream of yours from a very young age to do that so did you feel in hindsight now do you think there was an awful lot of pressure put on you or, or did you feel you still had some control over that? I definitely had control. I didn't have a family that was um, had reached a high level of sport. My mom wasn't even an athlete, so she, she was more the actress in the family. My dad was the athlete. And um, it was just like Jamie's doing her thing. And I used to speak a big game when I was little. I said, I'm going to go to the Olympics. I watched 88 and I said, I'm going to go there. And I just used to talk like... I meant business and people would laugh and be like, Oh, good luck kid. And you know, whatever, this kid's just a big dreamer. And I used to practice writing my signature on all my binders at school and paper. And I like, it was so silly. I'd look back at my signature and it was like handwriting, but whatever it was, I, I was already practicing this. Yeah. And I would go to competitions with my coach and I'd point to the signs that said, welcome skaters. And I would say, are they going to have that at nationals or at the Olympics when I'm there? And so I was just always speaking this, right? Like we know visualization and speaking are powerful, like an I am, right? So I was doing this without someone telling me to do it. So um, I, when I got to a certain level, my mom was like, wow, okay, I guess she's, we're going to nationals now. Like she just kind of rolled with it. She didn't really understand what was happening, which is really kind of a blessing in disguise because, yeah. she, because she just let me be me and she was just my mom. Um, and there's a whole nother story to my relationship with my mom that is, was a struggle with, she had massive depression, but you know, I was like, skating was my outlet. I didn't have, um, a really healthy home life. My parents were divorced and I didn't really see my dad. My mom was depressed and cried herself to sleep most nights. She was really struggling. And so, and I was bullied a lot at school and, um, like I was, I'm sh short. <laughs> so I was made, my height was made fun of the way I walked my haircuts, I, I didn't have fashionable clothes because my mom couldn't afford it. It was like skating or, or fashion. So I was always picked on and I used to hide in the bathroom or at the in the library because I didn't want to go outside and get laughed at or made fun of. And so skating was my, my outlet, my release. I would go there and Bryce, you've talked about this with like expression and I could really express myself on the ice. And I'm so grateful I had that because if I didn't have that as a kid, I feel like I would have just rebelled and got into a really dark place. And, um, but I got on the ice every day and I just was like, I felt free and happy. And then next thing I knew I was getting put in pairs at 12 years old. And I'm like, what is this? And then I realized I could fly. I was like, I can be thrown around and fly in the air. Yes. So then, um, you know, I took, I made a go at that with that partner and we did fairly well for what, you know, as far as we could go. And then I had a taste of where I could go, which was where I wanted to be at the Olympics. And I said to my coach here in Edmonton, I said, you know, we need to find myself a partner that is going to take me to the top. And so it was three years between my first partner and David. And it was a real struggle for me because I hated singles. I did not enjoy doing single skating, but that's what I was doing in, in the interim. And it was very painful. And then David came along and we watched Elena and Anton, our Russian rivals, in, in 98 uh, we did a tryout together and we watched them together um, at the Glenora club where we skated here and we were sitting in the bar watching going, you know, we could be there, right? Cause we had tried out two years prior in 96 and he was told not to skate with me because I was fat. I was like two pounds overweight. Yeah. So I'm like, we, you know, we could be there, right? I was trying to rub it in a little bit, but anyway, so there we were 98, we started skating. And then 2002, we were in the middle of a judging scandal. 
when you guys have a lot of chemistry on on the uh you skate i mean as, as a layman as someone that knows nothing about figure skating or any type of winter sports really um uh you you can tell that you guys had such a uh and i think it was in the peacock documentary where you said we were soulmates on the ice like you guys were meant to do this together and you talk about your what in the Bhagavad Gita, they talk a lot about Dharma, what Dharma is. And even though we come into this, this life in a third density body through the veil of amnesia, where we can't remember anything, a lot of times we have draws and passions that are part of our soul contract. And it's almost like from a young child, you knew that part of your soul contract was to be on the ice. And that's, yeah. you just knew it. You knew it. And so that was your Dharma. You just went with that. And we've talked about that off, off camera about this whole contract thing, especially with the scandal that happened in 2002. Yeah. Um, and if you guys, just to put it out there for those watching, there is a Netflix documentary called, and I'll link this in my description box called uh, Bad Sport that features your scandal. And then there's a great, for the Americans out there, there's a great peacock like what five episode or four it's a it's a four episodes it's multi and it's it goes into a lot of detail into mm -hmm. um all four of the skaters that were involved um and the judges and what happened but uh do you want to just give a little synopsis of kind of what happened yeah well it's it's tough to make it really short but i'll do my best so we we had gotten to the olympics and um we knew that and the, the media was building it up that it was the russians against the canadians but the chinese were very good as well so there was the three of us but generally the the russians and the canadians were going for gold and it was the battle of the two of the four of us and so in after the short program we both had skated well but we fell on our ending position so they had a second which was totally fine we we were fine being second. We like being the hunters, right? So um, that kind of just alleviated the, the pressure, I guess, going into the long program. So then um, how that went was uh, there was a team that skated first, then the Russians, then us, and then the Chinese. And um, I believe it was an American team that skated first, Bryce. So um, the warm-up was intense. You know, it's, it's the finals, it's the Olympics. And um, at the last minute, I always skate around to do – uh, a double jump and um, we're at the opposite end of where our actual first jump is in our program. And I purposely went more towards the judges on that side of the arena. And I saw the Russians skating around the opposite end, but I thought they were going to go diagonally down the ice and they ended up doing an S pattern. So we ended up meeting and colliding on our warm up. I don't know if anybody, a lot of people remember that, but it was pretty traumatic. And, uh, well, dramatic it, it, like I just remember hearing everyone like gasp for air and I could like almost hear the commentators going oh my gosh is this going to be you know a problem or I, I just it was like my whole world just went like in slow motion and I, I because I couldn't breathe I was down on the ice and I'd gotten the wind knocked out of me but we gathered ourselves up and we we all got off and um we heard the Russian skate and we heard a mistake we heard a, oh, we heard the crowd react. So then in my mind, naturally you go, okay, the door is open and you don't wish for your competitors to make mistakes, but this was like one little slip up can make the difference between gold and silver between the two of us. So we're like, okay, the door is open. And then, so it was our turn to skate and we had a fairly flawless skate. It wasn't, I, I don't like saying perfect because I don't know if there is such a thing as perfect, but it was pretty flawless. And then um, we're sitting there waiting for our marks. And the first set of marks was like, we, we did it. And so we were reacting going, oh my God, we're going to win. This is unbelievable. And then the second artistic impression comes up, which is usually kind of the, at that point, that would have helped us win. But it was like not. And it, the ordinal two came up and we were sitting there going, did we just miss something? Like what happened? Well, let's talk about the audience reaction too. Because... Well, Ooh. Oh my God. Like, and, and I know that half of that arena is probably people who are familiar with the sport of ice skating, but I know as someone who's been to the Olympics, you go to sporting events that you know nothing about, you're just there to watch. And the, and as a layman, I watched both of the performances on YouTube guys, you can Google it. And I told you, I was like, I saw it. I mean, y'all were smooth. Like you made it look easy. And uh -huh. that's, y'all made it look like it was like, I could go out there and do it. No problem. Like that's what it, and I've never been on ice skates, you know? So that's how y'all made it look. And that takes a lot of, a lot of control. And so you hear the audience just mm -hmm. in disbelief too, about that's how obvious it was that something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. 
I think people are trying to be polite, but at the same time, they're reacting to what they're, what you're just saying. They were reacting to like, what did we miss here? Like the Canadians were clean. Yeah. And uh, so they did, it was, it was an eerie feeling in the arena, like of the reaction from the audience. You could look over at the judges panel and like our Canadian judge was just sitting there like this. And then some of them were just like, like stoic, like they had nothing, no look on their face. And it was really bizarre. And then the poor Chinese had to skate right after us. Felt so bad for them. And they did a quad throw. Like it was pretty spectacular. And, but she didn't stick to the landing all the way, but it was impressive. But it was like everyone was talking and going yeah. like, what just happened? What just happened? So then we finish and it's medal ceremony time. And, you know, I'm on the podium. I'm trying not to cry, but I'm like, I'm not in the right spot. Like I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was trying not to be a bad sport about this bad sport. I, I was really wanting to make sure that they had their time and, you know, as much as I was hurting and sad, you know, it is what it is. And we knew from when we were little kids going, growing up in this sport that it was subjective. And if, you know, sometimes you win when you shouldn't, sometimes you're going to, you're going to be fifth when you shouldn't. Yeah. But, which is so even just saying that is so stupid, but it, that's how it was. So that was the night, you know, I'm sitting there going, wow, this is like, they have really changed the rest trajectory of my, my career, you know, because if you ask any athlete that has a pro life after you know being a silver medalist it's still amazing it's wonderful but you know your worth is that much less <laughs> i hate to talk about it like that but as a gold medalist all the sponsors want you you know you get asked to do other shows like you're the everyone wants you like and and sometimes the silver medalist is the bigger story which it turned out to be but at that time you're in your head you're like well that's it you know i'm not going to have the same career so we skate around after we get our medals and our flowers and the Canadian CBC, the CBC group came down, this French group came down and said to my partner, there's a scandal, there's a fix, the French judge and he was saying something and so we're skating off and he's saying there's a French judge scandal, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? What? So they and knew it, that that quickly then. So well, and I'll explain, Catherine. So we find out afterwards that it was it was already being talked about. There was a buzz like People in the skating world knew there were, it was already being talked about. The French judge even told our judge back in like, I think it was November the year before that he had to vote for the Russians, even though he really liked us. And our judge went, excuse me? Like, what are you talking about? So he decided to stay quiet because he said, I wanted to get to the Olympics and see if I could, you know, stop this corruption. Like, you know, I, I have no, he had no problem with Russians winning if they were, if it was their night to win, but he knew that this fix was in and he's like, I wanted to, to go to get there and make sure I could, you know, have some say in this. And, and so also, can I just say, um, because we all know there's other subjects that this resonate with to do with voting in politicians and things like this amongst many other things. Mm -hmm. But I suppose they had to be caught in the app because if he just said something before, he'd have needed absolute proof. And what would have happened if he'd have been removed from the situation? So you almost, I'm just bringing that to the awareness because there's so much talk and casting of blame and what people would do in those situations. But it's pretty complex situation for someone in that situation like him, isn't it? It's like now, right now with what we're dealing with, the censorship, you're a doctor and you're trying to speak up and say what you've experienced or what you've gone through with your patients. You're now, you're now losing your license, yeah. uh, vilified, you're deplatformed to all this. It's the same thing. If, if his name was Benoit or is Benoit and he said, if I would have said something, they would have found a way for me not to be there. Exactly. So, Oh, it's so but, hard. And that's what I just want to bring that up to people because it's so easy to sit back as someone not intimately involved, but these decisions are really complex. And if you you can't you you can't commit a crime, and to, you have to commit the crime to be you held accountable. Yeah, it. you can't just sit there and commit someone on. Oh, we think they were going to do this. Yeah, and there's a rumor. Well, you have to see what what she was going to do too. Like, was she gonna? Because if there could have been talk of this, but if she had voted in the appropriate manner then it would have nullified everything and y'all yeah. would have and there would have been no, you know, so. There were four other judges with her. That's where I go, okay, well, she was the one that went back to the hotel after the event and she confessed, as you saw in, I believe, even more in the Peacock one, where she confesses yeah. to um, a judge, her colleagues, and she's crying and she feels guilty. And 
And then obviously that stirred things up and everything, but there were four other judges that were with her. So why were they not talked about? I was like, this is so weird. This poor were they held to account, Jamie? Were they held to account? Were they prosecuted? Were they, did they oh, find they out who would, who, you see, the thing is who forced them to do it? That's where it gets real interesting. <laughs> probably tell you that they felt the Russians were better. That's what they would probably tell you. And even she goes back, she admits what she was told to do, but then she retracts that and tries to go back and say, no, the Russians were better. And we're all sitting there going, so now you, you just lied? Like you went, like, it was so confusing. Six days between our skate and our, and the cold gold medal that we got given, it was such a roller coaster of like every day there was something new coming out about what she said or what, what they were discovering or what was happening. It was so wild, you guys. And that's why they had to like basically shut it down because it, the story was taking over the Olympics. Yeah. Yes. And, like we are just two, you know, sort of small town Canadian kids that just wanted to go have fun and come home with a gold medal. And <laughs> we were in the middle of a media frenzy and we were literally reporters were fighting and cameras were flying and like it was crazy we were being followed by like i don't know what you call them and like the secret police like undercover like we were yes because well, the fbi you know, got involved right <laughs> well and i don't even this is so bad this is how I'm, I'm not i don't pay attention but like the canadian one too and like yeah they were all following us because they were worried that we were going to get harmed um because there was obviously threats that were coming in but we don't we didn't hear about it at the time we just hear about these things afterwards so i have to be honest with your viewers even like a lot of these things that ended up coming out even about the russian mob guy like we we used to just sit there and go like we had no idea no idea at the time no yeah idea. and then and then more stuff would come out and we're just sitting there going holy this is just getting better like it was like we were watching a movie and bryce you said something that dave said in the interview it was so oh, good. It like, was so funny. He because her her uh, partner, he's quite funny. I've noticed in a lot of his, he's got a very good sense of humor. And that is one thing I said to you off camera too. Like if y'all watch these documentaries, Jamie and David handle this with such humor in a lot of ways, and that is a sign of somebody who is very spiritually mature. Um, humor is the highest level of spirituality when you can actually kind of like years later like laugh about the situation because. Here And I think people can relate to you guys because most people in the world are small town kids. Most people in the world are you guys. You weren't just two Canadians. You represented humanity, like the normal, like you've worked your butt off. Here you are. You're naive to the fact you think everybody's integral. Like everybody's taking pledges. They're going to vote with their because you would. You would do yeah. that. You have honor. Yeah. But and so when all this happens, Dave said, he goes, here I was practicing my love story. Meanwhile, there's a Russian mafia. <laughs> the Russian mafia is already fixing the game. The way he said I was practicing my love story, but the Russian mafia is already fixing it. <laughs> and it was just the way he said it. It was like I, I applaud him because it was yeah. just comical that and, and how would everybody watching that? I think that's why people grew so in love with you guys in that in that event because they saw themselves in you they, wow. they 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 connected with the fact that this is not fair this is not fair and you said something on david show and i said it to you after where it hit me where you said the russians weren't supposed to mess up well yeah i say that just because like at that level you know they're generally pretty flawless yeah they're generally pretty flawless but that's what i mean by they weren't supposed to like you're you know they're always great. And well, they, and they still beautiful. But they were victims as well, weren't they? I mean, how awful that they've got a gold medal and how awful to have all this controversy about it for them because they, I'm assuming they knew nothing about this. I mean. Well, we're assuming that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing I will say that was really interesting, they, we all warming up backstage, we always took our corners and what we noticed at the Olympics, which was never done before with them was they came into our space and they'd never done that before. Bryce, this is the first time you're hearing this too. Um, and it, this is, this is where I laughed at myself afterwards when I, we were told when we were on tour by another Russian that this is their, that's their tactic. That's their way of kind of trying to psych you uh, psych us. Yeah. Psych us out or rattle us a little bit to just come in, come into your space where you're warming up. Well, guess what I was thinking the whole time I was like, Oh, this is so nice that they're being friendly. Like they're coming near us. <laughs> Didn't work. 
But you don't, yeah. you don't know how much is the coach because, again, you get on a lot of um, field sports where, you know, they're told to do tactics like that, like you delay the throw and you do this, you get a bit close, a quick shove. So how much is at the individual level and how much? But one thing that really hit from the story you were just telling there, obviously yeah. there's a lot of synchronicities with your story of what you went through back then. What was that, 20 years ago? And what yes. we're seeing now. And one thing that just came into my mind, yes, there was this huge scandal, but I wonder what else they were distracting from that was going on there. Because you know, I know you guys are doing a deep dive into the Olympics and a lot of, shall we say, the can we say the R word? Well, the art we'll just say the artistic interpretation. Yes. Uh, of what's there. going on there and you're these opening people. ceremonies and this was the olympics so i went back and watched salt lake city's opening and yeah. this was the olympics immediately following the big yeah. event that happened in the united yeah. states in 2001 and i got yeah. sick to my stomach because they brought out um the american flag that had been under i have to be under the rubble basically and of course as americans as the athletes holding it you feel like you're honoring but then you've got President Bush over there and you're like, what are they doing? What's going on? Now you're like, what kind of mockery is this that's happening? As far as the general public, and I'm sure other countries too, you're feeling the emotions of everything that had happened because we're human beings, right? Regardless of what country we're from, we're all human beings. We can all relate to tragedy regardless of, and have that, at least us normal, us 99% normal people. Yeah, not, not the psychopaths. Not the psychopaths. We can feel that for other people, regardless of whether we're the same country or not. We still feel that pain for them. Um, yes. So it's like, oh my God, they're harvesting these emotions and something else is happening. But it's mm -hmm. interesting, though, with with y'all scandal with with um, the mistake. If they had not have made those mistakes, it would not have been clear that there was a scandal at all. all. Mm -mm. At all, they could have got away with it. Yeah, and it was also involving the ice dance team because the French team, she's yep. Russian. Yeah, and there was when the Russian mobster guy got brought into the whole thing months later. We found out in August which is what, four months, five months later. So we found out about him. He was connected. They, they caught him and the Russian ice dancer. Uh, they had recorded a phone call that they had. So like he was working with the athlete. I'm just like, so we were, <laughs> things were just like, they don't even, none of the documentaries, they, they talk about them, but they don't focus on them. And I went back and no. I was like, who are these people? And I was like, yeah. looking them up and like, what the hell is happening? And the Russian guy, mobster guy, I guess was connected to one of the documentaries and excuse me for not for remembering, cause it's, I've watched both of them a while ago now, but my girlfriend brought it up to me the other day and she said, yeah, he's, it said in there, or, or they said something was either printed or, or was said that he was involved with that. And now that we know what we know that goes on at these big events, like you just want to be sick because, mm. you know, here this guy, anyway, it's just, it's so disturbing. But again, as athletes, I don't know any athletes personally, and I've been around a long time that know what goes on, like this darkness. And yes, we know that there's judging bias and there's going to be, you know, scandals here and there. There's been toe tapping where judges are like letting each other know what they're, how they're placing that skater. Like we've seen it, but not to the level that we know now what this is really about per se. And I'm not necessarily saying that like I was running my sport, my, my event that night, but um, there's something, there's something so much deeper in all this. I, yeah. I feel that now and you can see it. And again, just seeing like, what happened even months later and the stuff that came out, what else haven't they talked about? What else haven't they revealed? Like what did they <laughs> let what they let leak, but, and that's what I said, when you watch, especially the Peacock documentary, cause it goes in so much detail, you start thinking what are, okay, if this is all about money, then it's easy to be like, no, I'm good. I'm going to, I'm not going to do this. What are they holding over people's heads? That's what I mean, what yeah. how do you plot start type of situation to force them into these, because it is the French judge, you believe like when you it's it's obvious she admitted to this, and then she all of a sudden retracts, 
And yeah. she's not fooling anybody. Like, in my opinion, she's not fooling anybody. We know what she said to the head person. Um, it, that story has never changed coming from her, you know, um, no matter what gaslighting is be, trying to be done to cover that up. But it's, it's, it's just, and I said to you, Jamie, like, I feel like even though it's a 20 year mark, so people could say, oh, that's why it's been 20 years. No, I feel like there's a bigger purpose as to why this is resurfacing now. After all these years. That? Because we kept saying, like, we first did the Netflix one right before COVID started. And, and the fact that it's a Netflix one is pretty significant anyway. Well, they were doing, the, the group was from England, Catherine, and they came over and they, they told us that they were in charge of the skating story. And there were five other documentaries that they were record, like filming that were about scandal. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And we just think, oh, okay, they're just trying to expose some crazy things that go on in sports. Well, then we're in the middle of this stuff and you're going, well, because they were also a year delayed in getting it out. That was the other thing that was really interesting. They said, oh, it'd be out this August, which was like the first August. of, And then it came out the following year. Mm -hmm. And then that was right when we just already got started getting interviewed for this, the Peacock one. And I, I remember thinking, why is our story so popular again right now? Like it's 20 years old, like you know, even 19, 20 years old, why is this bring, being brought up again? Yeah, exactly. Was Netflix kind of taken over by the good guys? Right? That, that, I mean, I went, and I said to you on David's show, the 20 year, that's a karmic cycle. You and, know. and it's almost like, I know, I don't hope you, I hope you don't mind me saying this on camera. I said to you off camera, and of course I can't speak for anybody's like soul contracts. That's between you and God, but it almost feels like the four of you, you and David and Anton and Elaine had a mission maybe you didn't remember, but there was some karmic, like that's definitely a karmic tie that the four yeah. of you have. And, yeah. and it's bigger. It's, it's like, it's, and, and I'm, I get, it's almost like y'all were strong enough. God said the four of you are strong enough. Well, it's funny. If you yeah. asked us in our human meat suit right now, we've all four of us would go, hell no. <laughs> right. But you know, we all wanted to come home with our gold medals. It, it wasn't like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was a spiritual contract. But actually, that is interesting because I've, I've really dove into the spiritual side of, you know, our beingness and everything. And it like that made sense to me when you said that. I went, oh, my gosh. Yeah, maybe we had an agreement to do that, you know, and that's I mean, in the fact that it's coming back up, we don't have all the answers as to why things are being resurfaced. But we know that you can't you have to really like I mean, even for us that are awake. It, when we were learning these things, we didn't learn it all at once. We followed rabbit trails, right? We followed these trails and to bring this back up and the fact that more people are well, like the Olympics that just happened, bless those athletes heart. No one was aware that it was go even going on. The yeah. Olympics used to be one of the biggest things in the world. And now like nobody even, we're so like, our world is so chaotic that we're not even like aware of things. And, and so it's like, okay, let's revisit this look at this guys, look at what's happening. And, and I do want to put that out there. And we talked about this on my show too, like people like Jamie, David, the Russians, they, they, they are not doing the party drug. They are not yeah. they are hardworking. And I, I want, I want athletes to, because that you guys reserve, deserve all the respect in the world for the sacrifices you've made for the fact that you obviously do have raw talent that then had to be refined and worked on through incredible discipline. You know, mm -hmm. it takes discipline to, to train your body and the body isn't always ever, ever flowing, changing things. So it's not like one practice and you're good. It's a lifetime of working with and working as a pair and working with each other's bodies. And, and y'all all deserve Y'all, all y'all, that's a big southern thing. Oh. All y'all deserve deserve all the respect in the world. And just because the Olympics might be tainted doesn't mean the athletes are. No. And I want people to be able to separate that, separate the two. It's just like we were saying, Catherine, just because Disney World is bad doesn't mean that all the employees are involved in their shenanigans. Exactly. And I think this is so important for people to understand and hear your your perspective on that jamie because throughout the last few years we've heard that everyone in hollywood everyone in yeah. music everyone in politics everyone in sport and the mm -hmm. thing is people have to see people as individuals because you've yeah. very clearly got a lot of experience and, and also a huge amount of contacts over the years of people that have been performing at your level so talk mm -hmm. us through your experience of that well, 
you know what I do want to say too is when we're amateur athletes at the Olympics, we, yes. we're, not, we're not professionals. So I think, you know, when you, you're hearing about athletes that are involved in the, the, uh, the drinking of the ch- children's stuff, are we allowed to say that on here? That's as far as we could yeah, say. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. You did well. Okay. So with that, I don't know. I, 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 I just found out about that through my awakening, first of all. Um, there was a pair team back. I don't remember when they skated. I don't know how long ago, but they used, uh, there was rumors that they were drinking their urine and that made me sick. I was like drinking urine, like, no, thanks. So the fact that, you know, to think of even drinking the other stuff yeah. that's red is just absolutely like, I just want to almost vomit in my mouth right now. Like it just makes me sick. And so I don't know anyone that's even knows about it or like, it's not a thing. It's not at all. Consider it. I didn't even touch protein powder because they were, we were told that there might be something in a specific, in that protein powder that you're drinking that could be an illegal substance, but it doesn't have it in the ingredients. Like, so we're just like super clean. But the point is there might be some athletes that are involved in that, but it wouldn't, I don't think in the amateur world, like we're so like, as much as it was a high level event, you know, we're not big. I, I don't know. And I'm not trying to call any, any sports out here or anything, but um, you know, we might find out when this all comes out that there were specific athletes, specific ones in the professional worlds, like, you know, NBA, NFL, whatever that have, have been pulled into that. But I don't think that a lot of us athletes would even fathom that. Like it wouldn't be like, Oh yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. What I want to say, I know people, because we know with, with the drinking of this substance that people obviously look youthful, they have more vitality. So, but guys, Jamie is an athlete because she worked her ass off, not because she was drinking something backstage. And we have to think about the logics of this as well. This is a really dirty secret. This is a super mm-hmm. dirty secret, this drinking of stuff. And to keep something a secret you have as little people involved as possible. And the ones that are involved, you have to have stuff over their head so they won't that's, tell. That's what I mean. And those would be the big, bigger yes. guys, right? So and, common sense would tell you, know, you that most people are not involved because they're, this nefarious group of controllers are not going to be that stupid to not offer this to somebody who doesn't already have something over their head to keep them quiet. Does that make sense? Like these controllers are evil psychopaths, but they're not stupid. They're mm. absolutely not stupid. And so they're not just going to be passing it out like party favors in the locker room. Uh, no, I think but it's really with the, the drug testing that you go through as well. Yes. You yes. know, I mean, there's uh, such stringent drug le- uh, testing at all levels of sport. Mm-hmm. Now, okay. You've got to look at who's looking at the results and everything because yeah but you I just think I just wanted to put it out there so I think we were talking about discernment earlier and I know from when we've had conversations Jamie that it, it's so important to not tar everyone with the same brush and you've had you had experiences when they were making the documentaries where people would love you to embellish things or change certain aspects of the story and you had to stay really strong to do that yeah, well, I, 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 I've dealt with that my whole life doing interviews where you would speak in an interview and then the next day you would watch it on television and they would sort of take only one part of it where they wanted it to look a certain way and then they had an agenda tied to it and you're going, that wasn't at all what my perception or perspective was on that interview or a written one, like in mm. the paper, you would say something in this interview and then you would read the next day and it was so not what you had said and you're going, like things were twisted a lot. And so when I was filming, getting interviewed with um, the Netflix one, uh, they'd ask me a question and, and don't get me wrong. I really loved these people. They were awesome to us, but they would ask a question and I would answer it the way I wanted to answer it. And it wasn't like I was trying to be someone that I wasn't, I was just being me, but I was answering it from my heart. And then they would ask the same question, but in a different way. And, and I, and finally after the third or fourth time, I actually had to say, stop trying to get me to say something I don't feel. Because yeah. I can see what you're trying to do right now. You're trying to get me to say something that you're, you're wanting for, for drama. And I go, mm-hmm. I don't feel that. And it's not necessarily their fault, but they are trained to do that. Absolutely. Right? They say, well, they don't have to do that. But it's like, this is what people need to understand, that the things that we've been watching on television, 
is often very convoluted and twisted and it's it has there's there's an agenda to it or there's like and i'm not saying on absolutely everything but a lot because mm -hmm. we were supposed to do um there was a, a book written we were reading our script and it was a made going to be a made for tv movie back after our olympics and i was reading it and it was nothing of my childhood it was a complete made up story to add more drama to my my start the start to my career and i'm reading it going this isn't right, but I wasn't in hockey and I was mortified. And Dave and I looked at each other and we said, we're not doing this. This is ridiculous. But they said, well, we have to make it more dramatic. And so we kiboshed it because we said, if you can't tell our story organically, then we don't want to be in, we don't want this. And I'm laughing because how much more dramatic do you get with a rough and motion mafia? Like how much more dramatic do you get? But, that, but that's the level of integrity, which is something Catherine and I have been talking about. Like, how many people would have been like, okay, that's cool. Give me the money. Give yeah, me no. That. You know, like, just change my story. But you actually, you guys actually stood in your integrity and said, this is not the reality of, of what happened. And that's yeah. how people can change history. And the, as I said in our first episode, those that control the past control the future. And those that control the present control the past. And if you can manipulate history, you can manipulate the trajectory of the future. So even in something that seems so like, oh, it's just a TV show. We're just going to embezzle it. Uh, we're going to make it look good for entertainment purposes. Like, no, you're seeing what they're doing. They're changing history and then programming it into you over and over and over and over again. So that's... Yes. So important to stay in your integrity to stop that from happening, you know. Yeah. And and that comes also with a level of maturity as well, doesn't it? Of of having the confidence to actually stand your ground because you can see a, a lot of times when you're younger, you know, you've got some teenagers that 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 haven't necessarily got the um, self confidence or the tools under their toolkit to actually say no to a lot of things. So it's very easy to twist anything that anyone wants to say if you've got that agenda. And I think that's so obvious now to anyone that's watching this program. I mean, we we've seen that you just cannot believe what you're what you're hearing a lot of the time or seeing. It's so common. And again, the viewers are watching this. And so we get the story in our head of how this athlete is or whatever. And, and it can be bad or good, but it's like, it's not necessarily true. Yeah. And it's not just in sport. I mean, I, I knew someone 25 years ago, we have a documentary se um, series over here called Horizon. And they were interviewed for a business interview for Horizon. And this is a long while ago, must be about 20, 25 years ago. And they had the interview for the program and then when it was aired they put a completely different set of questions to it so it completely twisted oh, what wow. was said and that was someone i personally know and you're just like wow what a gut planning that goes into these things and and so my point is is i i just have really come to sort of an awakening of the last few months of just like you know what we've had so many things said about so many people in the public eye that we don't know and just to be really cautious about what you're believing because it's very easy to make up rumors about all sorts of people i'm not saying that these awful things aren't going on oh my goodness i'm not saying that at all but to tar everyone with the same brush yes. when you don't know them personally um, and when you start to see the level of manipulation that goes on at every level, I think is really, really dangerous. Yeah. Well, I even, as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking of like the big guys, like, you know, in the NBA or the NFL, like those guys that get invited to the Hollywood events and the parties and stuff like that, maybe where things happen, but in general, like most athletes are just living their life and competing and, you know, it's it's not it's not even I, I bet a lot of athletes don't even know about that stuff that party substance that they're drinking I yeah. bet a lot I, don't even know about it I know I didn't if I had to bet I would bet that most athletes in their prime probably live pretty boring lives yeah no because we're disciplined yeah and I, mean, I will say like I know athletes that that work really hard and play really hard um but now in these days like athletes aren't what they were in the 80s like they don't party like we didn't touch alcohol and if you're that serious and you're trying to make it to that level in your sport whether it's you know the world cup or the stanley cup final or whatever you're in you know you you're 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 doing whatever you can to be the best you can be 
So, and alcohol and drugs are not part of that. And partying, going to parties and staying out late and having that fun that a lot of my friends did. Um, and, and Bryce, you said something earlier about sacrificing. That is one thing when I did public talks, I would always say we never, we didn't sacrifice. We made a decision. We made a choice. And I never felt like I sacrificed, you know, not having, you know, the, a social life or going to parties or whatever. I said, I made a decision and I made a choice to be a competitive high level athlete. And so I never saw it like that. If anybody made sacrifices, it would be my mom you yeah. know, who sacrificed her income and to take care of my skating and let me do what I wanted to do. That's it, isn't it? And I mean, she I didn't have, she, I mean, there were months where we'd have, she'd have $50 left in her bank account. Like I look at now, right? I look at my bank account sometimes and it gets down to like 300 bucks. And I'm like, ah! you know, and she, she was like paying for my skating, working her tail off as an interior decorator and trying to make my life great, mm. but she had nothing. You know, we lived in a two bedroom apartment and like, it was very simple. We had patio furniture for a table and chairs. And I used to crank up the umbrella to sit under because I thought it was kind of cool. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And I, we shopped at like the thrift stores because we couldn't afford the fancy clothes, the brand name clothes. I used to borrow my girlfriend's stuff because I wanted to feel cool at school. But yeah. I mean, it's, but uh, remember your that. mom. Remember your mom chose that as well because we're mums now. Yeah. And she we, did. We would do exactly the same, you know. I, I would know, do, I do know. the same. But I know what you mean. I think people, you know, the whole family, it's such an involvement for the whole family. But yeah. it must be so wonderful, Jamie, to have that to look back on. I mean, you know, people talk about finding their purpose in life. And, and you must have, as I said, learned so many things now that you're carrying forward into your life coaching, your own personal life and, and the next stage of your journey you're on. So what, what's next for you? Oh, well, what's next for all of us? Mm. <laughs> we need, um, you know, I, I, it's very confusing time for me right now. I, I keep getting a download, though, that says stay still, be still. And um you know, when, when we talk about like we hear, we have thoughts or we hear a voice or whatever, I get these downloads. It just says, be still right now. And um, I, I, I've, I've, I don't like the word lost. Um, people in my, in my past recent life have transitioned out of it because of my decisions around my beliefs around all this. So my world has been really rocked, including a marriage ending and my 14 year old son not wanting to talk to me because I'm a lunatic. And um <laughs> Like I, there's a lot of things that I need, like when all this comes out, I feel like the world's going to be very challenging for a while mm -hmm. and, um, which is going to be okay because we need things to change, but I don't really feel the need to go into a career or like find a job. I don't feel that like, that's what I'm going to be doing. And Bryce, we've talked about this. Like, I know there's going to be, I'm a connector. I love speaking with people, I like helping people. So there will be something for me in, in that aspect where Maybe I'm helping the people that are waking up and they're struggling with it. I don't know, but um, I definitely really loved what I did as a coach. I was helping people achieve their dreams. And, um, but there's so much even in that I feel has been infiltrated now that I'm sitting yeah. back looking at it. It's like, oh, like what hasn't been infiltrated? So I'm kind of waiting for things to, I don't know what the right word is, but like get exposed and then we start living in the new earth 2.0 or whatever we're calling it. Like I, I need to kind of be in that space. And then I feel like everything will open up to us and we'll see things clearer. Everything will fall into place. That's I what know I think. A lot of people have asked, especially with our friend, Stephanie, who reads like, what's my new job? What am I supposed to do in the new? And a lot of times, like even in divination, it, they, the spirit world won't tell you. And yeah. I think it's because they want us to be in this moment right now and to feel all our feels and to move through the humanness of what we're moving through in order yeah. to be in a better place when that day happens. But I do, I've told you, Jamie, I think that you're going to have a huge job. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that there is a, definitely a karmic cycle happening. You, the four of you were souls that were strong enough to, to deal with what you dealt with. And that's, I tell that to, you know, we talk about the law of one a lot and it says there that for this timeline in history, everybody was lining up to come to earth right now and, and ride this roller coaster and God only, or whatever you want to call it universe, God source only picked the souls that were strong enough to be here right now. 
And so that tells a lot about all three of us and everybody watching right now. Like you are a warrior. You were picked to be here. That's why they attack so hard is they don't want you to know that, that you are so special. And, um, and I will say, now I've said this in almost every episode, Jamie, but I mean it. I've said it with Sean Stone, you guys who already had fame, who already had notoriety, who made the decision to start speaking. It would, it would have been very easy for you just to have your beliefs and not say anything just to go along with it, to get along. And we're seeing a lot of people that are doing that, but you decided to make that to be integral and to spread the truth because it's about humanity. And those of you that are already had those platforms have really taken a lot of unnecessary abuse. And I know Catherine and I have experienced it too, but on a such a smaller scale than what you guys have experienced. And for that, I will always have so much respect for those of you who have done that. And I'm, I'm going to put Jamie's Twitter link down in my description got, uh, a box. Guys, go follow her um, because um, it's so much it's easier. Special. It's nothing special. No, I, and, but it's so much easier when you're, I mean, my platform on Twitter was built off of Esoteric Atlanta. So very rarely do I deal with a troll. Very rarely. Exactly. Same with me. Yeah. And so, but Jamie's got fans. You know, like, and so you guys go follow her so you can, she can give that support back to her because I know, and somebody has said that multiple people have said to me about you, Jamie, like in messages, like the fact that you were somebody that we want, that people watched on TV, that you were somebody on the cover of magazines and that you're speaking the truth, the same truth that they believe it gives them hope, them, them courage. So you are, I'm going to get emotional. Just you saying being truthful, I don't know why I'm making so emotional. Um, you're helping other people. Well, okay, Bryce, this is this emotional time here? Maybe it's supposed to be encouraging, but it's because it's because of people like the two of you that got me speaking. I was healing all last year because of all the things I was going through, and I was really struggling, getting gaslit every day, ridiculed, shamed, dumped. Like I got all kinds of nasty things, and I wasn't even on social media. Then I stayed off of it. And then January, I got this, like, it's go time. You stand up. It's re- you're ready. You are ready for this. And I found you guys last year, all of you. And, you know, obviously, we're finding out that there are some of the people on YouTube that aren't authentic or real, but that's okay. You know what? Take the good with, you know, with whatever people gave you. But the point being is that you guys gave me strength. And to see that there was such a huge community in, in your world of speaking truth that I was like, okay, I'm so not alone. And I know it's like, we know we're on the right side of what's true, like the, the, the stuff that's going on. And cause we see it, once you see it, you can't unsee it, but it's, it was so challenging for me until I saw again, your talks and your, your courage and your truth. And I went like, it's okay. You know what? You're going to get backlash. You're going to get this. And I kind of had to go through that storm a little bit with people coming at me. But one thing I will say is interesting with this whole Twitter thing is I had, I would post something. It started off with me liking things and I got absolutely annihilated just for liking things. (laughs) So ridiculous, isn't it? Who even notices what people are liking? But I was, I was trying to be quiet, right? Like I'm just like, 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 and I got annihilated. Then I was like, okay, I'll repost some of these people that I follow. Okay. Then that was bad again. Well, then all of a sudden this whole Elon Musk thing and whatever happened. Um, I also gained probably about 2000 followers, which isn't huge. But what I really noticed was someone, someone would come after me with some like uh, a not nice comment and 15 people will attack them, not attack in a mean way, but tell them like, Hey, get lost or they'll set them. Yeah. I never had that before. Yeah. It's so important. I think the people that are standing up are, a uh, uh, really strong There's no, more think, bad bad. no yeah. yeah i do think um we need to get our friend liz to make us all t-shirts saying we are a danger to society because i can't <laughs> tell you how many times i've been told that and how many times people have um deleted me from whatsapp groups and um not been invited out to the gatherings and things like this and it is quite I, I you know i laugh about it some you know now but i do sometimes have a cry about it but you have to make space in your life don't you, you if you're if you're going to uh, uh, really be authentic to yourself if you don't let go of relationships 
from yeah. both ways they have to let go of you if you're not serving them and you have to let go of them and then this allows space for us all to get together yes and I, on that T-shirt note, um, I, you know, the, the convoy thing that happened in Canada, we were called the, fr the fringe minority, right? <laughs> okay, so I made my, a group of my girls, of all of us that are in the same mindset, um, I made us all, I got T-shirts, they were purple, because purple was supposed to signif uh, signify freedom, so they're purple, and they say fringe minority. And then I even had a sweatshirt that had, like, I had my two shots, and it was, like, shot glasses of, like, yeah, you know. Exactly. Whatever. But I'm, yeah, I'm trying, it's like, I'm not trying to make fun of the people that got it or whatever. It's just trying to make light of the situation. But um, the fringe minority is my favorite. We are so not a minority, by well, the way. Well, did you hear what Mr. B said yesterday about the M movement? I'll just say the M, the MA, you know, that movement. Um, he said what I'm paraphrasing, like that we're the biggest or something or I'm like, literally 80% of America is what you're talking about right now. Like literally, I mean, there are still Mr. T flags hanging on people's houses because every, every everyone knows, as I say down here, this all, everyone knows that shit stinks in Denmark, that yeah. something wasn't, you know, that something went right. And so, yeah. um, so it's, it's kind of comical at this point because it's such a farce. It's such a friends and members of my family who seriously believe and have told me on numerous occasions that no one in the whole world thinks like I do. I'm just a complete freak of nature. And, you know, it's hysterical. I cannot wait. I mean, I, I I'm not waiting for anything, but I'm just like, um, hello. <laughs> There's yeah. actually yeah. quite a few of us. But again, I, I, you just have to laugh or you cry. And you did say, have I got my glass of wine here? Well, I've got water at the moment, but yeah, sometimes, sure, sure. Yeah. sometimes it helps. And, and very soon we can all get together as well. We are having one big party. We're yes. Bryce we talked about this. We're going to, when I can fly, I can't even fly within my own country. Like this oh. is just, yeah, get no yeah. restrictions here. This is odd. This is odd. This is what I can't, but this will have to be for the next discussion because I've got to go and get my poor horses now. But yes. I, th I think, you know, isn't this fascinating how you can't fly in your own country and yet the UK at the moment, and I'm touching wood everywhere. <laughs> I don't want to bring anything to think, but we've got no restrictions here at all. Doesn't mean people aren't still doing silly things. But, you know, isn't this weird? How does that work I out? can fly to England, but I can't drive to Canada. We are, we are, I, I can't say we're getting at the hardest because Australia seemed to be not good. Yeah. Like, there's something about Canada. And I told Bryce, I'm like, I didn't realize how dark things were here. But because no. we're all just so happy and polite, whatever. But like, it's just so crazy to think that. And, and I, I posted that, Bryce. It was a, a picture of you know, the, the globe, like all of our countries and Canada's in red and it's the only country and everyone's like, that's not true. And I'm like, well, can you show me another country that can't fly within their own country? Yeah. Right? Like, show me. Like I, they say it's on some site and I go, I tried to look it up and I can't find anything. So I don't know. It's whatever. The point is, you know, the data's out people, right? And I'm not saying, um, I'm not shaming again. It's just the data is out, especially here. I don't know about in the States but or in the UK, but here that it's like majority in the hospitals right now. Mm -hmm. And yet they can have family members that are in there with them if they're sick or dying. Yet if we are any of our family members who aren't go into a hospital, I can't go in with them. Like there, it's that crazy here. It's a lot. It's just so sick. I was yeah. just, just like, like, we start. Anybody. We start explaining this, just be like that me when you explain your friends, babe, listen, we both conspiracy theorists now. We yeah. both, like it's not adding up. We're both good. You know it's not adding up. You know it. We're both conspiracy theorists now. <laughs> so you got 78% are in the hospital, and yet you're telling me who's healthy, like even willing to do a test to come in with a family member that I can't come in. Yeah. Just it's not, it doesn't, not. Make, it doesn't it make sense. sense. Yeah. And then everyone's just walking around like, oh, just get your job so we can move on. It's you're the problem. And like, <laughs> so, you get, so we can keep you safe. Oh, my God. I, I know that the world is completely inverted. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said 
you know, back Canada and Australia are having it worse. Those would be the two countries before this happened that people would say they'll be all right there. This won't happen where they are. And it just shows about and China apparently how much the veil yeah. has lifted and how much we're really finding out about things. And thank yeah. God, because you sound it perfectly, Jamie. You know, once you see, you cannot unsee. And this is why I feel so confident. I feel so confident because you don't ever go back. There's not one single person I know that moved on to be a conspiracy nutter that's gone back to the mainstream. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Oh. No, no, no. It's, it's everything. But don't worry, I'm normal. Because you can't fly, I'll send my unicorn over for you and you can come <laughs> on that. <you>. So, <laughs> Thank you. Or your spaceship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> spaceships and other ones, we must. Oh, it's so lovely connecting. Thank you so much. We will put all your links below. Um, um, and I'm pretty sure we will be back, ladies, for another instalment. And um, on Bryce's channel, obviously, for anyone watching it on mine, you will see the first interview that Bryce and Jamie did together um, with Stephanie as well, wasn't it? So um, please do go and watch that because that covers a whole different aspect of things as well. Yeah. Have a great day, evening, wherever you are. And thank you so much for watching, everyone. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye.